Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you to Castora for having me, and thank you to JC for interspersing the day with dad jokes. All the dad jokes made me wonder, what, what's the difference between a regular joke and a dad joke? And the more I thought about it, the more it became apparent. <laughs> I just learned that last week. I'm so excited I got to use it. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I'm going to be talking about how to grow your business and delight your customers with analytics. My name is Brandon Purcell. I sit on Forrester's Customer Insights team. That means I write my research for folks who have access to lots of customer data, and their goal in life is to turn that data into insights that will help them win, serve, and retain their customers. And there are a lot of different analyst functions at Forrester. There are people who write for enterprise architects, people who write for security and risk professionals. But if there's one central uh, tenet across our research, it's this. It's that today, we're in the age of the customer. And you guys know this. Something, something big shifted in the last eight years or so where the source of, of power, of dominance, shifted from the business to increasingly empowered customers. So in the past, we had uh, the age of manufacturing, where industrial powerhouses outcompeted their competitors. Then in the age of distribution, globally connected distribution chains led to, um, led to success. And then finally, with the emergence of Amazon and Google, connected PCs led to success in the age of information. Well, today, understanding your customer, anticipating her needs is what leads to success. And that's why Airbnb has been able to disrupt travel, Facebook has been able to disrupt publishing, and Uber has been able to disrupt transportation. The good thing is, that we need to understand these customers, and fortunately, they're Hansel and Gretling us a bunch of breadcrumbs, right? So we have this explosion in data about our customers. We have first-party customer data, transactional data, but we also have data that's external to us, right? We have social data. We have data from connected devices, from the Internet of Things, and it's our job to stitch all this data together and derive customer insights. And I think of customer insights as the gold buried within your data. Most of you who have, who have tried data mining know that that metaphor is very apt, data mining, because you start with a lot of crap and you're trying to find these useful insights. And in a perfect world, an, an academic world, the insights follow a sort of a life cycle. They start as data as your customers interact and transact with you. And then you apply some sort of analytics to that data to extract these insights. And then this can't just be a purely academic exercise. You have to take action in order to capture the value of these insights. And the reason that these insights have a circular rather than linear life cycle is because you need to learn from the efficacy of these actions. So did the, did the campaign that I sent to the customer resonate with that customer or did it not? Um, that's useful information to continuously optimize this cycle. Unfortunately, What's happening today and what most of my conversations with our clients at Forrester entail is some discussion around the data doldrums, right? We're drowning in data and starving for insights. The problem probably isn't that you're not capturing enough data on your customers. You probably have a data lake or some sort of Hadoop cluster um, that's capturing all of that customer data. It's the inability to actually extract the necessary insights from that data. And that's where customer analytics comes in. Um, it's taking analytical processes, oftentimes machine learning, um, which is what I mean by analytical insight, to design these customer-focused programs to win, serve, and retain customers. And the customer-focused programs piece is, is key. Um, I used to be a data scientist. I was a practitioner for about six years. And the reason that I left to go become a researcher is because I built a lot of good models that were really good in theory and tested very well and then ended up sitting on the cutting room floor because the right operational processes hadn't been thought out. How are we going to actually operationalize this model? Oftentimes, it's not the data scientist who's actually going to be creating a campaign to send to the people who are most likely to churn, right? So if you don't get buy-in from business stakeholders, the analytics are very likely to just uh, remain unused. 
Um, so when I talk about customer analytics, I'm talking about something different than traditional analytics or BI, where you're looking retrospectively into the past, usually at a universe of customers or at least segments of customers. Here I'm talking about predictive analytics, predicting what individual customers are likely to do, or maybe even prescriptive analytics. Here are high value customers who are likely to churn, who represent this much lost opportunity. Um, of course, the data, as I mentioned before, is different. There's a multitude of different data sources we have on our customers today and the infrastructure that we need to uh, capture that data and be able to analyze it is different than the relational databases of the past. If you are interested in investing in MarTech or AdTech, this is Forrester's um, what we call a, a tech radar that maps out the different categories of marketing and advertising technology based on their uh, maturity on the x-axis and on the y-axis the business value that they're adding to businesses. And where I've circled customer analytics there, that's kind of right where you want to be if you're a vendor or it's kind of right where you want to be investing if you're a buyer because it's adding significant business value and we think it will continue to add high business value and adoption is growing. Um, this isn't just about acquisition. Uh, what you see on the left here is Forrester's depiction of the, the customer life cycle from discovery, exploration, um, conversion, use, and, and service or, or engaging. Um, customer analytics is useful at the point of acquisition, right? Um, Look-alike modeling, finding those prospects who look like what your best customers look like. Um, you can see here, if you're doing that, you're already getting a more valuable customer. Uh, in the beginning, so the difference, the delta between that dotted line is the value of a customer without performing analytics on her, and the value of the solid line, of course, is with analytics. So you see you're already capturing someone with more value, converting them maybe using cross-sell and upsell analysis or product recommendations to increase that order value, and then at the end of the life cycle, trying to retain those customers who are worth the most to you. And we'll talk about some of those different techniques in more detail and see some uh, examples in a second. Um, but it's tough because I get a lot of questions about the buzzwords, right? There's a multitude of buzzwords out there. The big one recently is AI. I also cover AI at Forrester. And I have a lot of customers, uh, our clients, who come to me and say, we need to do AI. And I'm like, oh, God, really? May you know, maybe, maybe AI is the answer for you. Um, maybe predictive analytics is the answer for you. Maybe natural language processing is, but we need to go through some, uh, some framing first. And I'm, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how to frame the problem, and then we'll talk about the potential uh, solutions to that. So um, when you're thinking about customer analytics, it starts, ends, and iterates around uh, your business requirements. Um, so this is, if the, I think there was maybe one data scientist in the room, him or her probably recognizes this is like a bastardization of what's called CRISPDM, the cross-industry standard process for data mining. But what I've done is I put business requirements in the center. You have to figure out your business objectives. You have to get your stakeholders on board. You have to figure out what success looks like, how you're going to implement the model. And then you can start to touch the data, understand what data you have access to, prep the data. By the way, that data prep and understanding phase, as most of you know, is going to take most of the time, right? Modeling's sexy. It gets all the ink. But actually, modeling's pretty easy once you have the data in a, in a, uh, a format that can be used for machine learning. Typically, a data scientist will build multiple models, uh, create kind of a really nerdy tournament between them, and evaluate them. Maybe you'll take the best one and deploy it, and then ultimately you should measure success and communicate the results of that success. But the key here is at every stage here, you should make sure that the model you're building, the data you're pulling, the success you're communicating ties back to those business requirements. So at that first stage, when you sit down with your stakeholders, here are some key questions. Uh, what is the key business objective of the project? Um, I go into a lot of boardrooms and talk to executives about their key business objectives. And oftentimes, they get tongue-tied. Or other times, they'll tell me their key business objective is segmentation. It's, I, people tend to confuse 
the means with the end, right? Segmentation is just a means to an end. But what metric are you trying to move? What needle are you trying to move? Are you trying to increase revenue? Are you trying to increase acquisition, lifetime value? Are you trying to um, affect customer experience in some way, like um, increase net promoter score or CSAT? Uh, who's the project owner? Who are the necessary stakeholders? There's probably going to be an analytics person involved, probably going to be an IT person involved, right, who understands where data is captured, how it's captured, the cadence with which it gets updated. Um, and then there's got to be a business person who's ultimately going to take action based on this thing. Uh, what are the costs and benefits of this? Are there any risks or constraints we need to take into account? Many of you have business in Europe, so you have to think about the privacy regulations that just went into play there. We just got similar regulations uh, that were passed in California, and I think we'll see it in, in many other states in the next year or two. Um, what would an ideal solution look like in action? So how will we actually slice and dice customers based on these segments or propensity scores? How will we measure success? And finally, create a project plan. Then, and only then, we can turn to the data. So let's talk about data for a second. Data comes in all shapes and sizes. So we know it's coming from the web. It's coming from uh, connected devices. It's coming from wearables and home devices. It's even coming from the six or seven people who own Google Glass. So a lot of different types of data um, streaming at us. And it can get overwhelming. But I'm here to demystify that for just a second. So from a purely algorithmic perspective, when it comes to data, there's really two main types of data, numbers and things. Okay, so when you feed data into an algorithm, the algorithm looks at the variable and says, okay, is that a number? Because if that's a number, I want to know what's the minimum value of that number, what's the maximum value, what's the mean, what's the standard deviation, all that good old statistical stuff. If the, if the data, however, is categorical or thing data, it's going to say, what's the distribution of the values of this variable? Meaning, if it's gender, it's going to say, OK, is the distribution 50% male, 50% female, 51, 49, et cetera? And then it's going to see how statistically significant the values of that variable are with whatever objective you're trying to attain. Even um, time and date data, if you've ever typed a uh, date into Excel and gotten back a number of like 44,000, right? That's because it's transforming it into a numeric variable so it can do analysis. And string data, aka text data, strings of characters, what text analytics does is it turns that text into binary variables, one or zero. Did this comment mention Castora? If it did, there will be a one there, if not a zero. So data, numbers and things, even Google Glass. So as you're going through your data, because the next uh, step here would be to take an inventory of your data. First of all, figure out, all right, what data do I have access to? Um, not just like, OK, we have CRM data. No, what are, the, what are the variables in your CRM data? What are the values of that variable? You know, Dig deep into the data. Um, do I have access to it? Do I have to go somewhere? Are there any political issues with accessing different data sources? Where does it come from? Um, what info does it contain? Is it PII? Um, what is the state of it? How clean is it? Uh, good data scientists will do a data hygiene report. Is it structured data? Is it unstructured data? If it's unstructured, how are we going to deal with that? And then finally, um, am I missing data? Do I have to impute values? What do I do with missing data? So we've talked about business objectives, and we've talked about data. And so now is my favorite part of the presentation, because we get to take a trip to my favorite restaurant. It's, it's right around the corner here in Tribeca. It's uh, called Shea Customer Analytique. And we're going to look at the menu of analytical techniques that you guys have access to to turn your customer data into those golden nuggets we saw before. And so the menu is a little confusing when you first look at it, um, which is unfortunate because it's kind of like the cornerstone of my research. So I'm going to explain how to, how to read this pinwheel diagram. Basically, what you see is in blue, we have 15 different customer analytics techniques. And don't worry about the eye chart. We'll, we'll dive into them in a second. In green, we have the five different applications, common applications of those techniques. So things like acquisition, every company is interested in acquisition, or on the flip side, retention, or things like improving the customer experience. So let's dive into that. <clears throat> 
actually. Um, contextual marketing. So the methods that help us understand customer context. Well, text analytics is a big one. Um, taking that unstructured information, you may think social, but also if you have customer feedback channels, um, whether they're actually text or increasingly speech is a viable option as well, thanks to deep learning. You can actually process massive amounts of text to understand what's driving customers to give us feedback. What topics are they talking about? What's, what's causing negative experiences? What problems do we need to fix? How are they using our products and service? And even a more nuanced view of, of customers, like what, what's driving them to buy our products and services? Uh, location analysis, uh, for those of you who have access to location data, that can both be like geospatial data, where on the globe are my customers? For retailers, you know, where do we open or close stores? Um, but also, um, where are customers going inside of our, um, inside of our actually brick and mortar, um, our brick and mortar presence. And earlier we saw really cool stuff from, from the guy from Huge, um, what, they're, what they're doing with cameras in the store and Wi-Fi signals. Um, and then finally, customer device usage analysis. Here we have connected devices, um, IoT devices, understanding how customers are engaging with those devices. Um, if you're not doing that, don't worry. We have data that shows only about 10% of companies are even scratching the surface there. Um, so one of these, location analysis. So actually, the last project that I worked on as a data scientist before joining Forrester was for a company um, that made GPS devices. And GPS devices are pretty much commoditized at this point, but they realized that in their data, there was a potential for differentiation. And so they asked me and my team to create a model to predict where somebody is going to be based upon their past patterns of movement. And we predicted, we, we created a model that was 76% accurate um, in predicting where you're going to be hour of the day, day of the week. Um, the only problem for me, um, morally, was that this company made these GPS devices for subprime auto lenders so that a repo man could go out at night and predict where the auto was, would be so that they could repossess it um, if the person hadn't paid. Um, it was right after that that I made the move to research. Um, <laughs> So we talked a good amount about lifetime value analysis today. I'm also a huge supporter of lifetime value as a North Star customer-centric met metric for your organization. We're going to see a great uh, lifetime value case study in a second. I get a lot of inquiries about lifetime value. I get the most inquiries about segmentation. Companies saying, marketers specifically saying, okay, we've been doing segmentation, kind of an inside-out segmentation for a long time. Here are the factors we think are interesting to segment our customers, but we have all this data and we're not really using it to segment. And so coming up with more data-driven segments, whether they're affinity-based segments or maybe just clustering-based using clustering analysis. Um, and then lookalike targeting, we've, we've talked a good amount about today, but again, finding prospects who look like what your best customers looked like. So uh, this is probably my, my favorite lifetime value case study. It's, it's from a bank, but hopefully it's still uh, relevant to you. So Royal Bank of Canada, they wanted to understand um, not just who their most valuable customers are today, but which of their lower value customers were going on to become high value customers. So they created a lifetime value model and they, they looked longitudinally and they found there was this one pocket of customers who were actually pretty broke when they entered into a relationship with RBC, but they were going on to become like four times as valuable as their average customer. And they found that these people were newly minted doctors and dentists. So they were massively in debt. They were taking on more debt to open their practices. Um, but then they were going into these incredibly lucrative professions. And so they built some products and services specifically for this market and ended up growing their market share in this subsegment from 2% to 18% uh, in Canada. Now that's on the acquisition side. Um, of course, you're also interested in keeping the customers you have and, and keeping them loyal. Um, and here we have a number of different things. Churn analysis chief among them. So creating a predictive model to predict which customers are likely to churn. 
um, looking at past churners and allowing machine learning to identify those signals or patterns of behavior that constitute um, or at least signal a likelihood of, of, uh, of leaving your brand. Um, propensity analysis. Um, it's kind of a catch-all term, I have to say, for any sort of predictive analysis. I think in Castor words, this would be a little bit like GEM, right? Um, general event modeling, where you're predicting, okay, is this person likely to uh, unsubscribe? Is this person likely to respond to a campaign? And uh, social network analysis is not mining uh, someone's Facebook feed. It's actually looking at the connections between people to identify if one person churns, how likely is it that other people they're connected with will churn. Really hard, almost impossible to do for retailers, but the telcos are, are great at it. Um, so churn analysis. Um, I like this one because it's a it's it's kind of like the, the gold standard in churn case studies and that it's been around for a while, but Exo Communications, which is now a Verizon company, basically wanted to understand which of their kind of mid-market mid businesses, is B2B telco, uh, were high, highly likely to churn so that they could assign um, their limited human resources, their sales associates, account managers, to actually focus on retention of these folks. So they created the churn model and they focused on the top, uh, the people with the highest propensity to churn. And the ROI of this was 376% uh, with an average annual benefit of almost $4 million. And uh, these are pretty typical numbers when people first first start to go, when people go from zero to having a, their first churn model. Personalization. Um, a lot of talk about personalization today. Um, there are a number of different ways that you can personalize experiences for customers. Next Best Action has been around for a while. Um, I've actually recently been thinking about Next Best Action more in terms of Next Best Experience because that Next Best Action um, if you talk to a marketer, it's, it's some sort of campaign, right? Or maybe it's a, a product offer. Um, but that might not be what the customer needs. Like if I've just been struggling with something on your site, I don't want to be bombarded with marketing content. I want you to fix my problem, right? So I think that the next best action of the future is actually going to have to involve marketing, CX, sales, ops, to get on the same page and arbitrate between all of these different potentially conflicting signals. Nobody's there yet, but that's where I, I see, that's what I see as like kind of the, the nirvana state of customer analytics. Uh, recommendation analysis, you guys are all uh, aware of with affinities. We'll look at a, a fun story there in a second. And cross-sell and upsell analysis, uh, where you're trying to find those current customers, they may be valuable, they may not, but how do you sell them that, that next product? Who's most likely to buy that product that's going to increase loyalty and lifetime value? Um, so we're all familiar with recommendation analysis on your sites. As users of Netflix and Amazon, most of them are collaborative filtering based. If you and I look alike, Amazon's gonna show me more stuff that, that you've watched. Um, but, uh, but Walmart also does this. So Walmart wanted to understand what do people buy in areas in the US that are likely to be hit by a hurricane? Um, so what do you think people stock up on? Water, batteries, beer. You're right. They, they stock up on strawberry Pop-Tarts and beer, the breakfast of champions. So Walmart will put these items near the water and batteries, et cetera, in areas in the southern United States where a hurricane is predicted to, uh, to make landfall. And finally, those applications were, I'd say, pretty marketer-centric. Um, but customer analytics is, is also useful for customer experience professionals as well. Um, so customer satisfaction analysis, most of you guys probably have some sort of C CSAT. Engagement analysis, how often are customers coming back and, and engaging with us? And most recently, uh, journey analytics has been, um, has been a pretty hot topic. So journey, most of you are familiar with journey mapping, but with journey analytics, you take um, a specific journey. So most of you are interested in a, the classic journey, a path to purchase, right? Well, there are probably myriad different paths to purchase. Um, but journey analytics can find 
what are the top paths by volume um, to, to purchase and what are the steps and what's the average duration. But most importantly for you, what's the KPI at the end of those journeys? Like what's the AOV or the conversion rate of each journey? Because you could uh, migrate people from suboptimal journeys onto optimal ones, uh, journeys with a higher conversion rate. So um, this, is from, this is from a bank that uh, did uh, a combination of text analytics and journey analytics. So they wanted to identify customer pain points. And within the text, they found this, this one pain point where a customer said, um, here, I'll read this. I thought I paid my mortgage on August 31st, but my payment went toward my credit card. When I realized this a few days later, I contacted you and you said you would reverse the payment. It's now two weeks later and I'm receiving collections calls about my mortgage. The payment is gone from my credit card account, but it hasn't been made to my mortgage. Where is my money? So that's a negative customer experience. And the bank thought it understood the path or the customer journey around misapplied payments. So, you know, the customer, the customer makes the payment to the wrong account, they contact the bank, the bank initiates the reversal, and then one to two days later, the money is taken out of one account and applied to the correct account. Easy peasy. Well, obviously that didn't happen in the case of this one customer. So they pulled that customer record and looked at the actual timeline. And it looked a little bit like this. So the payment was due on September 1st. Um, the customer realized it on the 7th and contacted the bank and the bank initiated the reversal on the 8th and then 18 or 17 days later was when the, the payment was actually applied. Um, and during this time, the customer started getting collections calls and they received a late fee. So, um, it would be, it would be easy to say that this customer is just unlucky. But with customer journey analytics, you can then pull all the customers who've had a similar journey in the last 12 months. And the bank found that there were 5,000 people affected by this. And that the average duration of this application of payments or this reversal of payments was actually seven days, not the one to two days that was tribal knowledge. Um, and 10% were receiving collection calls, 25% or so were receiving late fees. There was a much higher attrition rate uh, for these customers' deposit accounts. So um, they created a project to decrease the payment reversal time to one day, uh, to modify the online payment process to make it less error prone, and they're adding a self-service payment functionality. So those are the 15 customer analytics techniques you can use. Um, but chances are you're not gonna use them in a vacuum. Um, there are dependencies between the methods. Um, for instance, just because someone's likely to churn doesn't mean you, you wanna save them. Um, if they're a not profitable customer, you might wanna let them churn. Um, or with um, customer segmentation, you may actually use a customer's level of engagement as one of the inputs into a segmentation model. Some of these uh, techniques are more mature than others. Again, on the x-axis, the overall maturity and adoption of the techniques. On the y-axis, the value that they add. You can see most of the predictive techniques uh, have high value, the, the techniques where you're actually getting a propensity score out of the model. And um, I'll let you guys take, finish taking pictures before I switch, but speaking of of the ones where you're actually getting a propensity score out of the model. We've talked about analytics, but we haven't yet talked about action. And this is the key, right? This is where the rubber meets the road, action. Um, the problem with action in many cases is you're getting something a lot different from these models than you're used to getting in the past. So with these models, you're actually getting a new column in a database, right? With a number between zero and one, or zero and 100%, which is a propensity of a, of a customer to do something. So you're not looking at a dashboard anymore. You're actually gonna have to segment or sort customers based on that propensity and then create some sort of crafted campaign for them or experience. So what we've seen is 
this isn't just about technology and analytics. It's also about your organization and your people. And companies have kind of been toying around with different organizational structures for analytics. The classic model of analytics, and many of you may be in this boat, is there are a few analysts in marketing who are doing some analysis. There are a few folks in finance who are doing analysis. Maybe ops has a couple of people. They don't really talk to each other. It's a completely distributed function. And that works well for the lines of business, but there's probably some inconsistencies in the way data is treated and, and certainly redundancies. So many companies have actually moved and completely centralized their analytics team. Now analytics is a shared service across those lines of business. Well, that's great, except for the fact that there's a lot of analytics needs across the business. There's no way that one little centralized team can service all, the, all those needs. So what we've seen actually, and, and which is, um, which we actually advise companies to strive towards is this hub and spoke hybrid model where you still have a centralized team focused on analytics governance, master data management at the customer level, but also these liaisons who report into that team but sit every day within marketing, sit every day within sales, finance, ops, leveraging the resources of that centralized team while focusing, keeping laser focus on that line of business. So you may be wondering how you stack up. Um, well, I suggest you assess your, your capabilities across six key dimensions. So strategy is, of course, important. Was the overall executive commitment to analytics in your organization? How well is it adopted? Um, next would be, what's next on the slide? Organization. So how, like I mentioned before, how are you organized? Also, do you have the right skills? Uh, data, what types of data are you using? Um, how are you managing and preparing data? Uh, analytics, what types of analytics are you using? Are you uh, tying the analytics to any KPIs? Are you measuring ROI? Uh, technology, so what technology do you use to create analytics, but also disseminate analytics across the organization? Activate analytics at the customer level? And finally, process. And this is one where most companies fall down. What is the process for generating an analytics project, for prioritizing your analytics needs, for taking analytics and turning it into action? And what we find is there's kind of four personas that fall out of these assessments, all the way from rookies who are barely doing anything to, to gurus. And in case you're, you're wondering, okay, which persona do I personify? Um, rookies. Rookies are the folks that don't formally invest in customer analytics at a strategic level. Um, it's more of an ad hoc activity, mainly just for marketing, um, composed of marketing generalists. Um, they really work with transactional customer data, and data tends not to be managed very efficiently. Uh, the folks who've invested a little bit more in, in customer analytics are, are dabblers. They still have that decentralized function but they're using a segmented approach uh, to marketing to meet acquisition and retention goals. Um, maybe there's some channel data in there with transactional data, and it's still pretty, pretty reactive function. Pros, however, are starting to use more predictive analytics. Customer analytics is a strategic priority, um, combined with digital data as well. We have, uh, every, every year we do this state of customer analytics survey where we ask folks, what kind of data are you using in your, in your customer analytics? And only 60% of companies say they're using their digital data. It means 40% are not touching it. Um, and these people are the people who've, who've heard the song that, that uh, Corey and Jordan and folks were singing and they're starting to use CLV um, as a key strategic metric. And then finally, the gurus, these guys, are, um, are using cust uh, customer analytics to uh, inform every customer experience decision. So this um, goes beyond marketing into customer experience and sales and product. And they have these multidisciplinary teams where there are uh, marketing specialists, yes, but also strategists and data scientists and data en engineers. Um, and then customer metrics are actually tied to key business metrics as well. So how do you go from uh, rookie to guru? Well, start with business objectives. It always comes down to business objectives. Engage your stakeholders early. Make sure everybody gets on 
the same page. Um, t take an inventory of your data. Um, it's easy to just throw up your hands in the air and say, our data is all over the place and it's dirty. Um, but start with the data that you have and that you're using and that you understand. 360 degree view of the customer um, gets a lot of people stalled with analysis paralysis. So we don't have that. Well, you actually don't need it to get value from analytics. And actually, if you get value from analytics with the data you have, you can probably build a better business case to get more a closer to 360 view. Um, select the appropriate analysis from my pinwheel based on objectives and data. Um, make a plan for action and, of course, measure success and communicate your results. So don't be dissuaded or be afraid to get your hands dirty. I promise you it will be worth the effort. Thank you.